Hello, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. So, as always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your driver on this journey. Uh, today, the topic that I wanted to cover is actually uh, kind of a, not a definite one. It's about uh, some psychological factors in chess. It's about being afraid of your opponent. And uh, that can show up in, in many, many cases. Sometimes it can be a helpful thing. Sometimes it can be a very, very unhelpful thing, right? It can change the way that you play, change, uh, change your style of chess into something you're less familiar with, and that can sometimes hurt your game. And today, we're going to be looking at it uh, on the top level. Uh, so of course, what player is everybody else afraid of, even at the, the top grandmaster level? Who, who is everybody afraid of these days? Magnus Carlsen. Magnus Carlsen, of course. Uh, so we're going to be like, taking a look at a couple of his games from the, the World Rapid Championship. And then uh, there are going to be more examples of, of his opponents being a little bit of afraid of him. Uh, not willing to, uh, to play some lines that, that perhaps would have given them a better chance. Then we're also going to be taking a look at a game of Peter Svidler's uh, against Alireza Ferruja. And now Ferruja, of course, is a, a, fear, a fearless youngster. Uh, he actually had a, a pretty winning position against Magnus Carlsen uh, in this same tournament. But today, we're going to be looking at how he stacked up against Peter Svidler and maybe how he should have some fear of, of these very talented chess players that he's now coming up against. Uh, Five-minute games, so these were actually uh, all rapid games. So those were a bit longer. Uh, it was the World Rapid and Blitz Championship, but we're going to be taking a look at the rapid, the rapid portion. Uh, first, though, I wanted to do a quick little warm-up. This is just a little puzzle that uh, I composed with my friend Julian, Julian Perleko. And uh, just to get you guys in, in the chess mood, let's see if you guys are, are able to, to solve it. It's actually a checkmate puzzle for whites. It's checkmate in five. So I'll let you guys take a moment to uh, calculate through, get the brain warmed up, and we'll see how you, how you do here. As always, we're keeping an eye on the YouTube chat. So if you guys have anything interesting to say, any ideas for the games, ideas for the puzzles, please just let me know, and I'll read your comments out loud, hopefully, depending. So any first impressions on the puzzle? Uh, knight b5, yeah, so knight b5 is, should be one of your candidate moves. Uh, the important thing to notice is that you don't really have time to waste here. Um, you can't play a, a slow move or something. I can't even think of a slow move. But you can't play a slow move because black is threatening checkmate in like five different ways. And, and so you, you have to do something to, to prevent all this. And usually that means the move's going to be a check. So knight b5 is a candidate move. Any other candidate moves coming to mind? What other checks are in the position? Let's just throw some out here. Yeah, rook a4 is a reasonable idea. Um, trying to, to take away some of these defenders around the king. Uh, any, any other ideas? So we have knight b5, rook a4. Do what? Yeah, so uh, of course knight takes is one of the moves you have to calculate, as well as rook takes. Um, so let's take a look at knight b5 first and see, OK, so rook takes b5 is the only move. And now, is there any follow-up for, for white here that you guys can see? Because uh, I'm not sure I, I do actually see it. Once again, you can't really just take, take material here because, uh, well, black is, is threatening checkmate, as always. So. so I don't think knight b5 quite works. But let's take a look at, at rook a4. And how did you want to recapture this rook? Yeah, so the, the knight makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm actually going to put rook takes on the board first. 
And this is actually kind of a, a puzzle within a puzzle here. Uh, well, I guess, I guess that it always is. But checkmate in two from this position. No, wait, sorry, checkmate in, uh, yeah. Let's just start with knight takes. It's checkmate in a few. The idea is very, very similar in both lines. But, but we'll, do, we'll do knight takes first. And now you have checkmate in, in just a few moves, actually. So how can we, how can we achieve such a thing? Yeah, hello to everyone in the YouTube chat. This is a pretty tough puzzle, but let's see what you guys can come up with here. Yeah, this is always a, a natural move, but I, I don't know if it accomplishes enough here. We could we could always just take. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the YouTube chat has an idea. Uh, they want to try queen takes a4. And so once again, there's two branches. There's rook takes and king takes. Let's start with king takes, because this is the, the simpler one. How does white checkmate here? Yeah, rook over, queen a6. And this is actually checkmate. So OK, that leaves rook takes. And then can we find a checkmate from rook takes a4? Someone on YouTube has it. I'll give you a moment, though. DM has it in the YouTube chat. OK, I'll give you the next move. Bishop d6 check is important. Uh, if rook b4, rook a8 is still checkmate. And if rook c5, rook b3 is simply checkmate. So yeah, queen takes d6 is next. And now checkmate in two. Can you find it with your two remaining pieces? Checkmate in two. Oh, well, not quite, right? If we count the material. Oh, and this is actually check. <laughs> but even if you could take, uh, black would still be totally, totally winning with the number of pieces. So not knight b5. Checkmate in two. Yeah, so Ben Simon has it. Rook b3 check. Nowhere for the king to go. Rook takes his force. And then, of course, the checkmate. Knight c2, as we said. And we see one piece left for white, checkmating the black king uh, due to the unfortunate placement of the rooks. So this was just a, a fun little puzzle I wanted to, to have uh, so you guys could get warmed up here. So in this main line, white gives away all his pieces in order to achieve this, uh, this structure and distract this queen. And then it's, it's simply checkmate. So well done to everybody who found that uh, in the YouTube chat as well. Very, very quickly. It's a very similar line if rook takes is played first. Uh, of course, with knight takes, we had to play queen takes uh, before we did anything else. But now, what should we do instead? It's a very similar idea. Uh, so queen b3 uh, doesn't quite work. You have to get the move order right, because we still have this queen defending the c2 square. So we have to do something, something about this queen first. Yeah, it's the same idea. So bishop check, and if queen takes, we have queen b3 and knight c2. Uh, you can throw in a, a rook to c5, but we'll simply take it. And if you play rook b4, Let's see if I can remember the solution to my own puzzle here. Uh, it looks like knight b5 is, is simply mate in one, for real this time, thanks to the pin on, on the rook. 
And so that's uh, just, just a quick puzzle that, that I wanted you guys to warm up with. Hopefully, that got you guys thinking. Let's move on to a few games here. So this first one, uh, like I said, these are all from uh, the Moscow World Rapid Championship uh, that just took place at the end of December. And this one was between Magnus Carlsen and Alexander Shimanov. Uh, and Magnus had the white pieces. And so let's see how they, both players treated this opening. Uh, Magnus played e4. Uh, Shimanov played the Karo Khan. And we see d4, d5. Magnus goes for the exchange. Uh, bishop d3, knight c6, c3, and queen c7 from uh, Shimanov. This is a little bit of an older line. Uh, these days, you know, most of the time, uh, simply knight f6 is played. And there are ideas of bringing this bishop out to actually this kind of weird looking e6 square, as well as fianchettoing this bishop uh, with g6 and, and bishop g7. But Shimanov chose queen c7. Magnus plays h3. And this is kind of not the most natural way of playing with white, right? You, you've moved a few pawns. But uh, does anybody know what the idea is between this h3 move and, and developing the pieces in this kind of strange order? What could Magnus be, be thinking with these moves? He's actually playing to prevent something from, uh, from black. One way to look at it is, where would you like to develop your pieces if you're black? And let's say uh, white had just developed normally. Where would you like to develop your pieces with black? Yeah, exactly, right? You would like to bring this bishop out to g4. This is the main point. And so by playing h3 first, uh, Magnus is taking away both of the natural developing squares away from this bishop. And so this is actually the main idea of, of white's opening here. He wants to prove an advantage because he's going to say that this bishop can't be developed to a good square, and the bishop's going to be bad, and that's, that's how I'm going to gain an advantage. And so like I said, historically this problem has sometimes been solved by playing g6 and bishop g7, and actually eventually uh, bishop f5 sometimes gets played here, uh, going for this type of pawn structure, or allowing this type of pawn structure if white so desires. And this is a, a pretty interesting way of playing. It's kind of combative. There's imbalances. And so uh, this is the main way that black usually plays against this bishop d3 and h3 setup, is by playing this g6 and bishop f5 line. But at the same time, Alex Shimanov was playing Magnus Carlsen, and perhaps he was afraid of going for such an interesting line. And so instead, he went back to the old way of doing things, which is simply developing the pieces, and accepting that this bishop is going to be locked behind the pawns and playing e6. And this is kind of the point I want to make about the fear uh, in chess here uh, for this game. You can't really change your openings uh, to this degree uh, because you're afraid of your opponent. Maybe you can choose not to play the Karo Khan if you're worried about this line and play some, some other opening. But what you can't do is go in for, for the Karo Khan and then not play you know, the, the best lines at this top level because you're afraid of your opponent. You have to, once you commit to the opening, you can't play subpar lines just because you think your opponent's going to know it better than you or be able to navigate it better than you. Uh, once you start making concessions like that, you've already admitted a lot uh, in the game. And chess is a very psychology-heavy uh, game. You know, Once you start admitting things like, uh, well, I can't play this line because they'll know it better than me, next thing you know, you, you stop trusting your calculation because you think, well, my opponent's better than me. He'll have calculated further than me, so I can't go for this line that I've calculated. And it, it kind of spirals. So it's really important in your games, uh, when you're playing a higher rated player, to play what you're comfortable with, play what you know, uh, and, and not really change it too much because you're afraid of your opponent, because you think they'll you know, understand it better than you. Uh, so that's the point I'm making really early on, even for move seven, uh, which it's, it's kind of a nuanced thing to, to see. Uh, Black's choosing this line over another line. But it really is relevant at this level, choosing, choosing a subpar line. So uh, castles, bishop d6, rook e1, b6. And black is saying, I'll develop the bishop out this way. But really, the fact is, this bishop isn't, isn't doing much on b7 either. We see knight bd2, bishop b7, 
simply queen e2 for Magnus. This keeps an eye both on the a6 square as well as the e4 square as well as the e5 square. Uh, of course, you know, bishop a6 would possibly be an eventual idea to trade off the bishops. Doesn't really make so much sense here. But the pressure along the e-file is quite relevant. Castles, uh, knight e5, rook a e8. And we actually see bishop b1 for Magnus. So I'm sure this is an idea some of you have seen before in your games. Uh, dropping this bishop back to b1 is, is actually a pretty significant tell. Uh, what, is, what is Magnus aiming for here with bishop b1? Should immediately be able to guess. Which diagonal? The B1 to H7. Yeah, B1 to H7. So how is he? Well, how does Bishop B1? Black can't get there to attack that bishop. Yeah, this is this is a very relevant thing. This bishop is trapped behind Black's pawns, and so Magnus is going to make use of this long open diagonal. But what is Bishop B1 saying specifically? What's going to happen on this diagonal? What is Magnus going to do? He's clearing the d3 square for another one of his pieces. How can you add more pressure to the diagonal? Exactly right. He wants to play queen d3. And uh, this is a very, very common way to uh, put pressure on the king's side. And if black isn't careful, black will get immediately checkmated. Of course, we've all seen uh, that combo before with the queen being supported by the bishop, checkmating the king. And if black is careful, he's still going to have to make some concessions on the king's side in order to survive such an attack. So that's what Magnus is saying he wants to do with, with bishop b1. Uh, in response, Shimonov played knight d7, trying to trade off this, this strong knight on e5. Uh, Magnus simply responds with knight df3, supporting this knight once again from, uh, from the trade. And now Shimonov plays f6. Uh, Magnus responds with queen d3. Once again, the point being, it's a little uncomfortable to defend this h7 square, especially with this bishop trapped behind the pawns. And so Shimonov has to make a concession. He plays f5. And this is already pretty, uh, pretty terrible for black, I'm willing to say. Uh, so what's, what's the big problem in, in black's position here? There, there's a few. Uh, yeah, you're worried about more, more kingside stuff, maybe? OK, that's fair enough. There's some very definite weaknesses in black's position that he's going to have to worry about. One might be the king's side, but there's one more in particular that, that's really kind of glaring. So that's, that's another good point, actually. These pieces are a little bit disjointed. Uh, right now, these four pieces all have the common goal of removing this knight on e5. But like I said, this bishop isn't really contributing. And these rooks, as well, uh, are a little un unclear uh, on what their, their role is in this position. So that's another problem. The big weakness that I'm talking about, though, is actually this pawn on e6. Um, by forcing uh, black to push this pawn up to f5, no more pawns can defend this e6 one. And if white manages to maintain control over the e5 square, this is going to be a, a permanent weakness for black. Uh, it's going to be really, really tough for Shimnov to defend. So already 15 moves into the game, black is significantly worse, right? And it makes you think, you know, maybe black would have also lost this game had he gone for this more active line. Uh, I'm going to say the best line for black. Uh, but. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe he also would have lost in that, that game, but this one is, is kind of giving up without a fight, right? You've let Magnus do what he wants, Magnus now has a weakness, and the rest of the game, you're going to be on the back foot, defending against the weaknesses, uh, trying to re-coordinate your pieces, and that's just not a fun way to play chess. Uh, so 
the fear in this game kind of uh, led to Shimano's demise. But let's see some more moves. Currently, there still is a threat to this knight. Um, let's see, there's three defenders and four attackers, so you can't quite uh, just ignore it. So bishop f4 defends once again. Knight f6 is Shimonov's choice, perhaps trying to make use of this square. And then after bishop h2, dropping the bishop back, avoiding any, any kind of g5s, any kind of knight h5s. We see knight d8 get played, trying to unveil this bishop, perhaps reroute this knight. And then Magnus plays a move that's really, really common for these types of structures. Uh, actually, kind of uh, for both sides, this, this is kind of an idea. But whenever you see pawns like this, there's a very, very common way to try and create more weaknesses, to create a weakness on this side of the board. So how can we try and weaken this, this pawn structure a little bit? OK. Uh, yeah, so that, that's one idea, right? Is you know, imagining if this pawn came to a6 uh, to kick this queen away from b5, then maybe these pawns would both be a little bit looser. But of course, one, uh, black doesn't have to kick this queen away in, in that manner. There's, there's a number of things black could do here. And two, this isn't actually such a weak pawn structure. Uh, it's very fluid, meaning if one pawn is attacked, uh, you can push it forward to defend it, yeah. or you can actually push the other pawn forward and to defend both pawns similarly, depending on what's, what's correct. So we want something else to uh, kind of force Black's hands with, with, uh, force Black's hand with these two pawns. And that's normally done via a, a pawn storm of white's own. And so very quickly, I'm going to, no, I won't jump around. But that move is a4. as. Aziz in the, the YouTube chat has found. And so now, if black uh, does nothing about it, we're simply going to play a5. And next, we're going to play a takes b6. And if uh, obviously, if queen takes, now this pawn is weak. And if pawn takes, now this b6 pawn is also without, uh, without a defender. And so we found activity on this side of the board. We have a weakness over here to target, a weakness over here to target with our pieces. And with two weaknesses, it'll be a lot easier to win. So a4 is always an idea to keep in mind. You can do it in structures like this. You can actually do it in structures where, let's say, these three pawns are all off the board. It still makes sense to use this a pawn to shake loose the a7, b6 kind of dynamic. It's a very common, uh, very common plan. So a4, black did not want to allow a5, so he played it himself. And now Magnus uh, just starts playing very, very simply. Uh, he has the type of position that, that Magnus really is, is great at, although he's great at many types of positions. Uh, but what I'm talking about is black has created weaknesses, white has not really created weaknesses, and Magnus can now just take his time, win the game uh, on his own time. There's no rush, there's no complications to figure out, he just has to attack these weaknesses and eventually black will crumble. And that's what happened this game. We saw queen e2, this knight does come to e4. And the bishop comes out to d3. Uh, once again, there's really no more attack on this diagonal, thanks to this, uh, this push that black has done. And, but the purpose has been served. The weaknesses have been created. So now Magnus is sh simply shifting his pieces back. We see f4, and now c4. And so black, trying to expand on this side of the board, has loosened up his control of the e4 square. And Magnus uses this pawn to uh, kind of show that. We see rook e7. This rook comes to c1. And now, really, the discoordination of the black pieces is showing. And Magnus simply wants to open up the position to make use of that. We see queen b8. c takes d5. e takes d5. So Magnus has fixed this weakness in order to open up the position. Bishop b5. And forces, pretty much, uh, bishop takes. Otherwise, knight d7 is, is kind of coming. So. Bishop takes, clears the d6 square for the queen. Now we do see f3 from Magnus. Of course, the difference between these two knights is that this f pawn has already been pushed, and this f pawn can still shake loose this knight. 
The knight comes to g3, captures, captures, queen e3. And this is just a tough position uh, for black here. After knight c6, you can't really capture this to get rid of your bishop, because rook takes, attacks many, many, many pieces all at the same time. So rook e8 instead. And now after queen e5, takes, takes, king h8. Uh, there was simply too much, too much activity for white, and so a tactic uh, kind of appears with knight takes a5. And after takes, we see takes, takes. And after rook e1, bishop c8. Black, for the moment, has two pieces for, uh, for the rook, uh, as well as the pawn. But white's rooks are so active that the game quickly kind of falls apart. Rook f8, takes. And now, with connected pass pawns on the queen's side, this is a very, very easy win for, uh, for white. We see the, the last few moves get played. Magnus just pushes this pawn. And there's nothing to be done here. Uh, Magnus is going to make a queen and, and win the game. So any questions about how it all kind of fell apart for black there? Uh, it was really all in the opening. Uh, and then Magnus did some Magnus things and, and transferred the, the pawn weakness into a, an advantage in activity along the C file and used that to, to kind of win the game. But uh, really, black's mistakes came through in the opening. That's where he lost this game. Uh, but yeah, any, any other questions about it? <clears throat> OK. Uh, wonderful. So main points. Don't change uh, your opening play because you're afraid of your opponent. You want to play what's best for you, what you're comfortable with, what you know. And switching that up, uh, going back to an old line uh, in the hopes that maybe Magnus won't remember as much about it, is never going to be a good plan. You want to play what you know. You want to play what's best. And then just a brief idea here. Making use of this open diagonal, because black has committed this bishop to, to a worse diagonal, is how Magnus kind of showed the fault in black's opening play. And then lastly, this a4 idea is very common uh, to break up this, this structure. Uh, as always, the principle of two weaknesses, right? You have a weakness here. You want to make a weakness on the queen's side. Those are the main points I wanted to hit. Uh, now I want to take a look at a very, very fun game uh, between Peter Svidler and Ali Reza Ferruja. Uh, of course, Peter Svidler is one of the all-time greats in the Grunfeld defense, uh, perhaps the greatest Grunfeld player to, to ever play the opening. Uh, Peter Svidler knows, knows his stuff in the Grunfeld. If there's one thing you can say about Peter Svidler, it's that he's a great Grunfeld player. So with that in mind, uh, with the black pieces, one thing you might try to avoid is, is playing the Grunfeld. Uh, because Peter Svidler knows his stuff, he knows the lines, and if you play it against him, you, you, better, you better know what, what you're up, up against. So we didn't get there directly, but after g3 and bishop g7, Bishop g2, castles, d4. Peter Svidler has adopted for uh, kind of a Catalan type structure with uh, you know developing on the queen slide like this. But after d5, black runs into the Grunfeld. Of course, the Grunfeld being denoted by playing this d5 and allowing white this option to take with the pawn, and black will have to recapture with the knight. And so the idea of this opening is that. Even though you waste some time capturing this pawn with the knight and getting kicked away with another pawn, what you do end up achieving is forcing, well, not really forcing, but allowing white to kind of overextend into the center. And with this overextension, you want to attack the center and try to prove that it's more of a weakness than an asset. Um, so this is my next point about fear in chess. It, it can be useful, right? So uh, Alireza goes into the Grunfeld fearlessly against Peter Svidler, one of the greatest Grunfeld players of all time. And this might be the case where it, it might be wiser, in fact, to choose a different opening line. I'm not saying play the Grunfeld, but play you know, a simpler version of the Grunfeld, because that's not what's going to work. We saw that in, in the previous game already work out for Magnus and not work out for Shimonov. But at the same time, you could avoid playing the Grunfeld against Peter Svidler. And the rest of this game, I just wanted to go over because it's, it's kind of a, it's a really good example of, of what makes Peter Svidler so great and why perhaps you shouldn't play the Grunfeld uh, against him. Um, so far, this is all kind of charted waters. These moves have been played before. I, I would call this still theory. Uh, we see queen e1 hits this knight on a5. The knight comes to c4. White develops this knight to c3. Black challenges the center with c6. 
Of course, that's the idea of his opening. You want to challenge the, uh, the overextended center. b3 is actually uh, white's choice. And if you take a look, uh, this knight is a little bit stuck, actually. You can come to e5, I suppose. But uh, let's see. So black, instead of, of moving this knight around even more, is what I'm trying to say. He goes for a, a sacrifice with, with pawn takes d5. The idea being, after white captures the knight, as white does, black gets to totally rip open the center in exchange, as well as he has some very nasty pressure along uh, this diagonal, which he's going to hope to use to reclaim some material. First off for white, uh, this knight is attacked, so he moves it out of the way. Uh, black continues with f5, uh, trying to keep this stronghold in the center in exchange for uh, this, this pressure on the diagonal. And that's, that's his compensation for, for the full piece. We saw bishop e3, and now queen d3 from Alireza is his choice to regain material. Uh, and here, uh, Peter does a very, very uh, nice, nice thing for, for, for white. And what he does is gives some of the material back. Uh, and this is a very, very common idea in, in high-level games. Uh, when one player plays a sacrifice, he wants to get a ton of compensation, a ton of activity for it. And very often, the best thing to do with the player with more material is to give some of it back to alleviate some of this pressure, some of this compensation. And once you give it back, uh, you'll still be up a slight edge in material, and you can use that that you know that less extreme material imbalance to to your advantage to take away some of that activity. And so that's what Peter does. One option for White here would be to play a move like Rook C1, trying to hold on to everything. But this I don't think is is a very good idea here. Um, I'm not sure what, what the direct refutation is uh, off the top of my head. But by wasting more time defending things like this knight, you allow black to still have this, this very nasty bishop. And perhaps black can just continue simply with something like knight takes c4, taking more pawns away from uh, the white camp. And instead of that, instead of allowing black all this activity, what Peter does is plays knight d5, offering up the exchange. In return, he's going to trade off some of these active pieces. And that is exactly what happens. Knight takes d5, c takes d5, queen takes d5. And once again, this bishop is so active that Peter chooses not to care in the slightest. He doesn't move the rook out of the way, giving another pawn. Instead, simply queen b4, allowing bishop takes a1 and rook takes a1. And so now the, the smoke is, has kind of finally cleared. Uh, Black finishes development with bishop e6, and this is kind of the position we have reached. And already, a lot of things have been decided here. It's a very, very imbalanced position, but it's one I'm sure Peter kind of understands better than his opponent, which is, which is the problem. Uh, so let's kind of take stock of what happened here. What is our current material count? This is a difficult question uh, compared to most material count uh, questions, because it's kind of wildly imbalanced. But let's just take stock. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pawns for black, merely four pawns for white. But in return, we see one rook for each side, one queen for each side, one bishop for each side. White has two pieces for the rook. And so it is white's task to prove that this uh, imbalance of two pieces for the rook is, in fact, worth the full three pawns. And Generally, it shouldn't be, right? We say two pieces is worth about a rook and a pawn, sometimes a rook and two pawns. But three pawns is, is pretty extreme. So let's try and find uh, you know, where is Peter's activity coming from? Where is his compensation for now being down a material? What do you guys think? Where is the compensation? Yeah, one thing is this pawn on e7 can, in fact, be captured. Uh, so, you know, while we could take it immediately, uh, perhaps this isn't what uh, what Peter had uh, had in mind. I think uh, Bishop F7 would have to be played. And now, actually, this this queen, you know, it, it's fine uh, on E7, but it's it could be doing more. 
But the point stands, e7 is weak and, and can kind of be captured at, at many, many moments. So there's one thing in particular that, uh, that black has done here. And that is, he's pushed a lot of these pawns forward, right? And what that has left is some open space around this king. And specifically, these diagonals are very, very, very much open. So what happens uh, when you have open diagonals and you're facing the bishop pair? Uh, you run into trouble, right? So this is the big compensation that, that Peter has for, uh, for this extra one or two pawns is that these diagonals are going to be great, great homes for, uh, for white's bishops. And already, he goes to, uh, to make use of it, right? He's threatening, uh, already, a tactic to, to win material. He wants to bring these bishops onto these open diagonals and harass the, uh, the black king. Uh, in exchange, Alireza plays rook a c8 with the idea of covering the square, trying to prevent the bishop from, from arriving there. Now Peter takes the time to take off the last defender of this diagonal with knight takes e6, and also allowing queen takes b7. So Peter regains one of, the, one of the pawns that he's down. He still has these monster bishops and these wide open diagonals uh, actually aiming at both sides of the board. And this is actually just far too much for, uh, for black to handle. This is, I would, I would be willing to say this is close to winning, winning for white. Despite material, uh, white has far more, more active chances for his pieces. So we see queen f6 hitting the rook on a1, rook d1, g5 is played, rook d7, and even the, the white major pieces are doing better than, than black here. See king f7, queen d5 check, queen d5, and now bishop takes g5. The bishop was of course covering many, many squares. And now with material uh, coming back into white's favor, the peace activity really shows, and the game is, is quickly decided. Uh, just, just a quick note of warning. Never go in for, for any end game where you have a rook against two bishops. Uh, in, in just the clear end game, the bishops are, are so much more powerful than the rook. They cover so many more squares that it's, it's almost always going to be winning for the side with the bishops. And, and that holds true here. Uh, we see g4, and now white has created a passed pawn, and that is more than enough to, to win the game. We see him advance this pawn, and now the bishop will come and uh, escort this pawn all the way down the board. And that is how uh, Ferruja, who had a phenomenal tournament, a phenomenal showing in the World Rapid, actually dropped a game here to Peter's Fiddler. So where did black actually go wrong is an interesting question. And I think it's one that can be determined by, by the opening. Peter chose this specific uh, line, which very clearly is wildly imbalanced and gives white a lot of chances, gives both sides a lot of chances. But because you know he's the best Grunfeld player in the world, uh, he understood the position better. And once you know the game kind of deviated from totally known territory with this bishop e3 move, a novelty from Svidler, Perhaps, uh, perhaps Ferruja wasn't entirely prepared to, uh, to meet the complications that, that the position uh, was asking for. In fact, here, it's, it's already a bit better for white. And after queen d3, it, it's simply much, much better. This knight d5 idea, I think, was discovered over the board. And it's already plus two for white after we see uh, some, some accurate moves. So simply, simply much better for white. And uh, that's uh, the risk you run when you go into an opening that you know your opponent is kind of a specialist in. So this is kind of the line that I wanted to, to walk with this lecture. On the one hand, you can't play afraid. You can't play uh, moves that you know to not be you know, perhaps the best because you're afraid of what your opponent knows. But at the same time, you, you absolutely uh, don't want to play the Grunfeld against the world's greatest Grunfeld player. Uh, and these are very extreme examples, right? This is chess at the top level, but you can apply it to your own games as well. Uh, say you know you 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 know who you're going to play, you know your opponent, you've you've known him for years, and whenever you play the 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 Slav, you always get destroyed. You know he he knows this line much much better than you. So going in, 
does that mean you should play a, a worse version of the Slav to avoid the, the line that you know that he, he's really good at? No. But what that does mean is perhaps you should look at some other opening choices. Uh, you don't have to play the Slav. You can play some other opening that perhaps you both have less experience in and just you know, get a chess game. That, that's really the goal here. You just want to get a chess game. And Shimonov didn't really get a chess game because he played a passive uh, line and immediately had weaknesses to deal with. And meanwhile, Feruja didn't really get a chess game because he got outplayed in the opening. Uh, he didn't know the opening well enough. He went uh, to the other side of the pendulum. He went totally complicated, wild, wild opening. But when you do that against someone who's a specialist, then uh, you run the risk of just getting destroyed, which is what happened. So those were the two main, main opening lines uh, that I wanted to show. This is how fear can kind of impact your game. You can play too passively, or if you're totally unafraid, you can go in uh, for complications against someone that you shouldn't. Um, all right, any questions uh, about this game? It's kind of a wild one, but uh, I, I think that the, the, the point I made was, was not, not too crazy, right? Uh, it's very clear that Peter Svidler understood this opening better than Ferruja, and because of that, that that's why Ferruja lost. But OK, any questions? All right, no? Well, let's move on to game number three for the night. We have Magnus Carlsen against Liam Lee, uh, the Vietnamese player who actually formerly has won, I believe, the World Rapid Championship. And so it's interesting to see him uh, here back again, competing with the world's best, uh, in this case, in Magnus Carlsen. So let's see uh, how this game transpired. We see d4, d5, c4, d takes c4, and Magnus chooses e4, a very interesting line in the queen's gambit accepted. For those theoreticians out there, usually, uh, lately, knight f3 has been a very, very common way to play with the white pieces, guarding against any e5 breaks before you, you go about your business reclaiming this pawn. In this case, though, Magnus simply plays e4, and now after knight f6, e5, knight d5. And what Magnus is doing here is similar to what we've seen kind of in the Grunfeld. It's the modern way to approach uh, the center. Uh, black gives white a big center in the hopes of being able to, to tear it down shortly. In this case, though, we see bishop takes c4, knight b6, bishop b3. This bishop comes out to f5, and now after knight f3, and e6, knight c3, knight c6, bishop e3, uh, bishop e7. Uh, we see uh, kind of a, a strange line from black here. Uh, what black has done is allowed white to, to keep this center for, for quite some time. And what that means, uh, it's not bad yet for, for, bla uh, for black, but black does have to be kind of on his toes. He has to do something about this center. Because generally, if you just let the center sit for uh, a long, long time and you let white uh, develop his pieces around it, eventually it will be worse for black. So what you need to do is find some way to tear it down. And that happens in a few different ways in this opening. But the main thing that is generally done is black plays queen d7 and castles queen side. So of course, the center guards this f6 square, meaning there's some problems on the king side for black. So black castles queen side, and at the same time, adds much more pressure to this d4 square. And this is generally the prescribed way of handling this opening these days. Instead, though, we see bishop e7, which is by no means a bad move. But after white castles, black also castles king's side. And perhaps this is, uh, uh, this is Lee M. Lee being a little bit flustered, uh, kind of forgetting, forgetting the, the main ideas of this, this opening. You know, by castling king's side, he's, he's already making some concessions here. He's giving Magnus something to play for. And this is kind of a, kind of a problem. And I mean, uh, I'm no armchair psychologist, but you know, perhaps some of this comes from, from being afraid of Magnus. You know, we see players all the time not going for the main lines, not going for the main stuff uh, against Magnus. And I think that that stems from this fear that Magnus knows what he's doing in, in all these main lines. But by playing something a little bit offbeat, that doesn't always increase your chances. And in fact, this is one of those cases. So we see a3, knight a5, hitting this bishop, uh, forcing white to relocate. He chooses the c2 square. And now this next move was, was really, uh, really where black, black started to go uh, very, very wrong. 
So bishop c2, what's, what's a natural way to respond to this? Uh, what's a natural way to respond to bishop e2 and the tension between these bishops? You have a couple options, I think. Yeah, so you can take the bishop, or you can move the bishop out of the way, uh, either to, to g4 or even g6. I'm not so sure I like bishop g4, because once again, when you vacate this diagonal, you, you run into some potential problems. Uh, in this case, obviously, this bishop could just come back here. But you do have to be on, on the lookout for, for problems on h7. But I very much like taking the bishop. And even bishop g6, I think, is a playable move here. Uh, what you don't want to do is what happened in the game. Uh, what black played is queen d7. And this allows white to trade the bishops on very, very favorable terms. Uh, white gets to play. Pawn ta or bishop takes bishop, forcing pawn takes bishop. And now these pawns are much more dangerous than they used to be. Uh, the main idea of, of this opening for black is that these pawns, while very far advanced, while controlling some key squares, they aren't you know, fluid. It's tough to get them rolling, right? And we see in this position, the only way to kind of advance this central structure is through this d5 square. And right now, white simply doesn't have enough material uh, aimed at d5 in order to achieve that, meaning black has this d5 square well under control. And so then eventually, you might see a move like rook c8 and a move like c5 with the idea that this pawn is going to be the weakness. This is how uh, black generally treats the structure. And so if you're going to allow this change in structure with takes and takes, you really need to control this d5 square. Uh, and perhaps Liam Lee thought he was controlling the d5 square, but in this case, he, he's simply not. Uh, let's see what, what could have been. Like, let's say white wasted a, a tempo somehow with king h1. What should black play here almost immediately, just to be sure that d5 isn't going to get played? Yeah, you can play c6. That, that's one of your choices. Even simply knight d5 is another choice for black. But at all costs, you have to stop d5. And so of course, uh, white doesn't want to waste a tempo here. White simply plays d5. And now this position is, is pretty hopeless for, for black. Uh, hopeless might be extreme, but it's very, very good for white. Uh, of course, now white has the option to respond to any threats to his pawns by advancing even further and even some ideas of, of creating more tension, you know, these pawns are, are fluid. And that's what you want to avoid when giving your opponent a big center. You want to avoid those pawns getting rolling down the board. So uh, after d5, Magnus really uh, is, is simply winning uh, already. But let's see what happened here. Uh, knight a c4 was Liam Lee's choice, hitting this bishop. Magnus actually chooses to trade off the knights on b6. And now Magnus simply plays rook b3. And let me ask you what, what Magnus's next two moves are going to be, assuming black doesn't make any threats. It's very, very simple chess. And this is kind of the problem for black here. White doesn't do anything special. He simply plays the most natural moves, and they're very, very good for him. So let's say you know black like you know makes some some slight improving move. What are what are white's next two moves? This isn't like a huge puzzle or anything. It's it's just very natural play. Yeah, you just bring the rooks to the center. That's that's all you have to do, and that's exactly what happened. Rook d8, rook d1, rook e8, rook e1. And now all of white's pieces are perfectly placed, supporting the strong center. And meanwhile, black's pieces, you might say, are placed to attack the center. But the fact is, you don't have enough support. And this bishop is quite, quite awkward for black. And so the game continued with g6, just kind of a, a strengthening move for black. And now white simply sits on the center, which is horribly cramping these black minor pieces, as well as even the black major pieces. And he plays h4, just taking his time. King g7, 
h5, probing for more weaknesses. After bishop c5, queen c2. Uh, a5 is, is played for black. Black is really kind of trying to improve his pieces, but it, it's very, very difficult to improve around such, such a strong center. And that's kind of the theme of the game. Uh, queen c1 was played, queen e7. And now after queen f4, knight d7. Like I said, trying to find ways to improve the pieces, but this knight has no forward, forward advancing moves due to the, the strength of the white center. So knight d7, and now uh, let's let's see. I guess this is um, this is a moment when uh, when Magnus really kind of breaks through. So I'll ask you guys to find Magnus's next move. It's justified via tactical means, but it's a way to open up the position now that we've placed our pieces on really good squares and even created some threats on this side of the board as well. So I'll give you a hint uh, before I, I actually set you loose on this one. So a huge advantage to the center is it gives you the, the opportunity to swing your pieces to either side of the board very, very quickly. Right? You can see this knight can easily jump to the queen side. This queen has full reign over the, the fourth rank to go back and forth. So something that's useful to do when you have a big center is to open things up on both sides of the board. So we already have some threats on the king's side if, uh, if black isn't careful, involving something like h6 and using this diagonal. But now we want to make some threats on, on the queen's side. So how can we open the queen's side? Yeah, b4. But can you, can you play b4? And does it work? So what happens in this line? So I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying you have to solve this problem. Oh, that's fine. You can block it with d6. Then. Yeah, that's exactly right. There's a nice, uh, what we call an interference tactic of pawn to d6. Uh, blocking the queen's support of the bishop. Of course, you don't have time to save the bishop or take this knight, because the queen is hanging. And if you want to take this pawn, what does white play now? Oh, so I guess you can't actually take it back. I was originally thinking simply uh, queen takes bishop, but I think this move is actually much more powerful. Uh, you, you can't recapture because of queen takes, and you can't you know, just move this queen out of the way because of, of queen takes bishop. And so d6 would be the tactic justifying this. I do want to mention, though, uh, some people in the YouTube chat were suggesting e6 here. So what do you guys think about this, this e6 move? Is this a good one or a bad one? It certainly is uh, opening things up, which is kind of how I, I presented the problem. But is this a good idea for, for white or not in this case? Yeah, it opens up this diagonal as well as this diagonal, right? And in addition to that, it's trying to open up this E file. But uh, is E6 the, the type of move? Well, OK, it's, it's a very leading question. So I'll just, I'll just tell you. E6 is not the type of move you can play lightly. E6 is actually giving up quite a bit. So from this position, these uh, strong central pawns are very much cramping the black pieces. And what I mean when I say that is they control all of these sixth rank squares that would be great to put black's pieces onto. We can't put these pieces here because these pawns are placed the way they are. And after a move like e6, let's say uh, simply captures, and let's say rook takes is, is the most natural. Um, well, OK, Let, let's say black, white plays a bad move like, like pawn takes. Now from this position, it's very, very easy to see that uh, Black's position has been greatly improved because the addition of these two squares 
for his pieces is, is very, very nice for black. You have advanced your center further, creating some more threats, but you've allowed black to get his pieces back into the game. And yeah, I will say, so of, of course here, rook takes I think would just be winning because of uh, this problem for, uh, for black, but black can throw in bishop d6 first, and then this one is, is much, much less clear. Because once again, black has found uh, squares for his pieces. So e6, uh, these types of moves can sometimes just be winning the game by, by forcing things open. But if they aren't immediately like winning, then you really don't want to play them, because it gives up a lot of your control in the center. So that's why b4 was played here, opening things up on the queen side. We see pawn takes, pawn takes. Uh, this bishop comes back. Once again, we saw this tactic with d6 uh, against bishop b4. So bishop b6 instead. And now this piece has been even further sidelined from defending against these central, th central threats. And now let's see how Magnus finished it off. h6, king g8. Now there's always threats on this diagonal. And d6 was his final choice to, to really uh, end the game here. This was the way that Magnus chose to, to finally release the tension in the center and open things up. So why is d6 a better move than e6? For example, why not why not e6 here from from white? What was the reason I said that this move was not really what uh, what white should be doing? Yeah, it gives up the d6 and the f6 squares, and these squares are very very useful for the black pieces. Whereas d6 gives up which squares? Yeah, c6 and e6. And so d6 is a good move because of Magnus's follow-up, which doesn't allow the black pieces to actually use these squares effectively. Uh, black plays queen f8. Uh, if black were to actually capture this piece, I think there's some problems involving knight d5, as well as, as simply recapturing. Um, but OK, so queen f8 instead, removing the queen from the immediate threats of knight d5. And now Magnus continues with e6, which is a very, very mean move, uh, completely ripping open the entire center now that uh, white has enough threats to, to just be winning. So f takes e6, and now d takes c7. And black gets this e6 pawn, white gets the c7 pawn, and this is just tactically losing. The rook has to move, and now we can take this free knight. And the game very quickly reaches a conclusion. Uh, white already up a piece as yet another tactic to win the game. And that's how it all uh, actually collapsed for Liam Lee. Um, so this game, uh, what went wrong was black made a very, very, very strange decision to allow white to capture this bishop on f5. And the only circumstance you would ever want to do this is if you have total control over the d5 square already, such, such that you don't mind giving up this, this defender. In this case, he didn't have that, and Magnus kind of just steamrolled him. Uh, and so once again, and the topic for tonight was kind of fear in chess, as well as just taking a look at, at these, these games from the Rapid World Championship. And so in the first two games, uh, in the first game in particular, Shimonov played a passive line with black because he was afraid of Magnus. In the second game, Feruja fearlessly played the Grunfeld against Peter Fiddler, kind of swinging the other way a little bit too, uh, a little bit too far when in fact sometimes you need to respect your opponent a little bit more and uh, not play a worse opening line, but play one that you know he's less familiar with. And then in this game, uh, it's tough to attribute uh, this, this to fear, but Liam Lee played such a weird way against Magnus that you get the feeling there was something psychological going on here. Uh, against a low level, gr level grandmaster, I don't think Liam Lee would have allowed bishop takes f5. It's a very, very strange move to allow. Uh, it's a very kind of basic mistake to, to make. And uh, perhaps that had something to do with, with him sitting across from the world champion. Um, so any questions uh, on the lecture overall tonight? No? OK. Well, thank you all very, very much for joining me. 
this has been the first edition of Road to 2000 in, in quite a while. Uh, so I'm happy to be back doing more of these lectures in the new year here. Hopefully, I will see you all next week. Thanks very much. <laughs>